Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series. My name is Suzanne Miller, and I'm a principal researcher in the SEI Software Solutions Division. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, McKinley Sconyers Hassan. We are here to talk about security risks in application programming interfaces, known as APIs, and how they impact zero trust. But first, let me introduce our guest. McKinley is a solutions engineer in the SEI CERT division who recently authored a blog post and paper on this topic, which we will link to in our transcript. Welcome, McKinley. Hi, thank you, Suzanne. So McKinley, let's start by telling our audience a little bit about yourself, what brought you to the SEI and the work that you do here for those who haven't met you before. Um, you've only been at the SEI for less than a year. You've already authored a paper, a blog post, and here you are with the podcast. So I think a lot of our listeners would be interested to hear how you came to work here and what you like about the work that you do here. So uh, like you said, I've worked here less than a year, about eight months, and I came to work here because um, I wanted to get into cybersecurity about a year ago. It's not what my background was in, but I thought it would be a good place for me to be. So I did some learning and long story short, I ended up here at the SEI and I like working here and I wanted to work here because I think the work we do is really interesting. There's constantly new things to be learning and different projects to be working on and it never gets boring. And that's exactly why I'm here too. It's very, really hard to get bored. Um, so I'm glad that we have you here and that you're doing this work for us. Uh, we have done previous podcasts on zero trust and APIs. And for our audience members who are new to the topic, can you just do a brief overview of the two concepts in case they haven't run into them before? Yeah, so application programming interfaces, APIs are kind of like a connector between applications and other applications or users. They can be as simple as someone accessing all of the items on a web page that a store sells, or it can be as personal as accessing your bank account and seeing how much money you have in your account. It's just a way of being able to access, modify, or delete data that an application has access to. And zero trust is a concept related to network security. So traditional network security focuses on the perimeter of the network, things like firewalls, whereas the center of the network, once you're inside of it, is not heavily protected. Whereas zero trust focuses on protecting the interior of the network as much as pr protecting the uh, perimeter of the network. Very good. So. In your paper, which we will link to in our transcript, of course, you noted that because APIs are intentionally designed to be exposed to the public, they increase the attack surface of a network, which I can see how that could happen. Um, how does this potential security issue impact the concept of zero trust within a network? Yeah, so because APIs are meant to be exposed to either the public or other applications or other entities, it creates an access point in the network, which can be risky. So this affects zero trust because it means that those APIs, for one, have to be designed well, they have to be coded with security in mind, and the configurations with the API and the infrastructure surrounding it, like API gateways and things like that, mm -hmm. also have to be well configured to make sure that they are protecting the network and uh, implementing zero trust. And I, I know that in some settings in the past, so, you know, when I was back in the day, when I was a young software engineer, APIs were new and, and they were actually not trusted at all. I mean, that was the whole idea of having these, these interfaces that could access something without it being a direct link from one piece of software to another was considered to be very risky. Over time, this has become standard practice, partly because we do have some ways of protecting the perimeter that we didn't have, uh, you know, back in the 80s. And, uh, and we didn't even have necessarily what we'd call a perimeter back in the 80s. But also because they have become so useful as a concept. 
So this means that we have a lot of people that are possibly building APIs that may not have as much uh, uh, knowledge about what the security risks really are with APIs. So you outlined three top API security risks in your white paper and some recommendations for mitigating them. And that's why we're, that's what we're here to talk through today. So can you go ahead and walk us through those, please? Yeah, so the security risks are, the first one is third-party software integrations. So nowadays, because there is so much software in existence, it's really easy to use other software libraries or pre-made code to create your own APIs. And it makes the process simpler, but if those pieces of code, those third-party software integrations have vulnerabilities in them, then you are potentially putting vulnerabilities into your own API, and that can be risky. And then there's also cascading failures. So when you create a microservice architecture, which mm -hmm. is typically the architecture that APIs are created with, which have a lot of API endpoints, they are supposed to be designed to be loosely cu coupled, which means they're not supposed to be heavily dependent on each other. As in, if one API goes down, it shouldn't affect all of the other ones. Right. But if they are not uh, loosely coupled and they are heavily dependent on each other, it means that if one API goes down, it could potentially cause slowdowns or even uh, an entire outage for the network. So that is a risk of APIs and specifically when it comes to microservice service architectures. And then there's also the increased attack surface, which we talked about previously. Mm -hmm. um, older designs for applications were more monolithic than they are nowadays. And those monolithic architectures tended to have fewer API, APIs than modern day uh, architectures do. And because of that, more APIs means more access points in the network, which increases the risk of potential vulnerabilities. So organizations need to protect themselves against these risks and take, and take mitigation actions. Um, let's start with the third one and sort of move backwards. What kinds of things should an organization do to protect against, um, as our, our third one, the increased attack surface? And then we'll go to the others. So to mitigate the risks of an increased attack surface, one thing you could do is to be strategic about adding more APIs. Each API does create another entrance into that application and potentially into the network. So making sure that that API is necessary and the risk is worth adding it to the existing infrastructure. Also making sure that all APIs are documented preferably through auto-generated documentation. It's a very common issue that most organizations have, which is having lost APIs, as in they've written them and then they forget about them and then those APIs are no longer being updated for potential vulnerabilities right. and that creates more risks for the network and for the organization. So making sure you do all of those things can decrease the risks of the increased attack surface. So having a catalog of your APIs is, is something an organization can do to, to make sure they keep their, their APIs updated and understand what their actual risk is. Yes, exactly. You have to know what's in the network to make sure you, act, you can actually mitigate those risks. And that kind of also relates to the cascading effects. If I don't know what APIs I have, I can't know why I'm having effects from one of my APIs failing. So why don't you talk about that one, the cascading failures risk? Yeah, so that one's similar. One of the main things you can do with that is also making sure that your network is well documented to know what APIs are dependent on each other. Because uh, ideally, none of the APIs would be dependent on each other, but that's almost impossible to do. But making sure that you know which ones are dependent on each other, that can help make sure that if there is a loss of service in somewhere in the network, you can more easily figure out where that is happening. And then also just designing the network to make sure that the APIs are as loosely, loosely coupled as possible. Right. And then for the first risk? Yeah, for third-party integrations, uh, for one thing, you can do risk assessments on all third-party software that you might be integrating into the network, making sure that code doesn't have serious vulnerabilities. And then you can also stay up to date on 
new vulnerabilities that come to light with the integrations you have in your software. So there may be vulnerabilities that you don't know now and that nobody really knows of right now, but they might come to light in the future. Sure. And making sure that you stay on top of that is also a way of preventing uh, third-party software integrations from causing serious issues. And this one also in my mind involves a training activity because uh, modern software engineers just innately go out on the on the internet and find snippets of code that are similar to what they're trying to work on. And I mean, it's a shortcut that unless you're in a you know secure area where you can't get to the internet, almost everybody takes, but that is, that is third-party software, right? It's, it may not be commercial third-party software or, you know, labeled as open source, but anytime you go out and grab, you know, snippets of code from the internet, you are essentially introducing third-party software into your system. And, um, you know, I, I've talked to several software engineers that just, when I said that, they kind of went, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> have you run into that problem as well? Um, not, I haven't run into personal issues with vulnerabilities, uh, with that type of code because I have, I don't, haven't worked in cybersecurity very often, but I have worked with a lot of people who do take code off the internet. I was a teaching assistant in grad school and I taught computer science classes and that's a very common thing for right. students to do. And they're allowed to do it or at my university they were, but we don't really teach enough about how that can be dangerous in terms of creating vulnerabilities in the software you're creating. So yeah, you're right. Being teaching people that uh, just taking code offline or using third-party software integrations may produce risks and potentially huge risks for what the software you're creating is something that we should teach more about. Yep. And yeah, I'm, I, uh, in my day, that access that we didn't have that resource. I mean, you might have a friend that had something they'd coded that you could, you know, go ask them to, to you know, send you the the, the source code so you could retype it. <laughs> I mean, we couldn't even hardly even FTP at that point. Um, yes, I started back in the day of punch cards, so that's how old I am. But um, now I, you know, like I said, uh, it's 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 a whole different world in terms of what people have access to, and I think that's one of the things in my whole, uh, you know, talking to folks out in the world about cybersecurity, it's not my main field, but because of these podcasts, I end up talking a lot more about it. Um, there's just so such a lack of awareness of some of these risks. So I'm really glad to see you writing about this and talking about it so that we can really make this something that people think twice before they just grab something and don't know what its security implications are. Um, which kind of leads me oh, to the, the subject of transition. Um, what are the resources available to me and the software engineers that are out there that want to do a better job of using APIs and making sure that the APIs they use don't introduce uh, unnecessary risk into their system? And where can I find those? Yeah, so there are some articles written by the SEI, if you look on uh, online about APIs and more specifically about zero trust, which can also help in the protection of APIs. There's the SEI zero trust collection, which is a grouping of webcasts, podcasts, blogs, all talking about zero trust. And all of those can help in ter terms of implementing zero trust and just making sure network safety is uh, prioritized. Okay. Um, and for you, you're new, but uh, you, you've already said you don't like to be bored. So I'm guessing you have something new and different that you're going to be researching. What are you working on that we can bring you back to discuss in a few months? Uh, yeah, I've been looking into more stuff about APIs, specifically about coding practices and general best practices when it comes to APIs as a whole. Excellent. So hopefully I'll end up doing something like that in the future. Also needed something you can take back to your uh, to, to your computer science classes you used to be an assistant for. <laughs> yeah. All right. I want to thank you, McKinley, for talking with us about this today. As I've said, I think this is one of the modern software risks that, especially those of us that sort of come from my generation, don't think about as often because we came at building software a completely different way than it's being built today. And so I think it's important to get these ideas out to everybody, not just the young people but all of, all of the people that are working um, in this industry. And for our audience, 
as I mentioned previously, we will include links in the transcripts to the resources we mentioned in this podcast. Uh, finally, a reminder to our audience that our podcasts are available everywhere you find podcasts, including my favorite, the SEI's YouTube channel. If you like what you see in here today, give us a thumbs up. And thanks again, again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.